Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Will Frankel, and I'm one of your three AF fellows for this year. I think it's safe to assume that most of us have never experienced something like the pandemic we've lived through for almost a year now. For many, it was and continues to be a period of confusion, uncertainty, and apprehension. What often feels like uncharted territory brings something new every single day. History, however, shows that past epidemics have produced a variety of responses. And while history might not repeat itself, sometimes it might rhyme. Timothy Thaler is the William E. Leverett Jr. Professor of History at Berman University, where he has been a part of the history department for over 25 years. His research focuses particularly on questions of poverty and social welfare, as well as religious persecution and coexistence in early modern Europe, which has taken him to the archives in and around Northern Germany. At Furman, Thaler has directed several study away programs in Europe and the Mediterranean, most recently, a semester long program in Central Europe entitled Repressions, Resistance, and Remembrance. Thaler received his bachelor's degree in math and history at Baylor University and earned his master's and PhD in Renaissance and Reformation history from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Using the written Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, we will be accepting questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students. So when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Timothy Thaler to the FNAM. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Will. It's, it's great to be here. Um, and of course, as Will mentioned, we're in the midst of this, this epidemic, a current crisis that none of us have experienced. And um, it's clearly affecting, at the very least, this particular um, event, right? We're not face-to-face, -face, we're doing this over Zoom. Um, so the real life implications are, are being experienced right now. Um, in the 17th century and beyond is, is largely the focal point of what I'm going to talk about with vignettes and some anecdotes to try to give a little bit of a sense of some of these kinds of responses that we've seen throughout history and um, provide a little bit of context for them as well so that we can see the multiple multiplicity of, of responses as well as the um, various perspectives, political, religious, social, economic, uh, views of medicine, views of uh, science that have shaped the ways in which people react to each other. Um, there's no single response in any one of these times. There are multiple responses. This particular image is from the 17th century in England. That's London in the background. And we see uh, the plague striking as death is standing on the coffins with its, its arrows. Um, and a variety of, of responses and a variety of interactions. We see we fly people flying, fleeing the plague, uh, keep out um, the quarantines and the officials with their pikes and swords, keeping them out. Um, I follow, the death and the contagion follows wherever they happen to go, even if they do run away, and of course we die. So these responses um, in this very uh, poignant uh, image are going to, and to some extent, shape what I'm going to look at. I've decided to use these four uh, little verbs basically as the, the organization for what I talk about tonight, the examples. So um, first I'm going to talk about quarantines and kind of governmental reactions to dealing with the plague. Um, then I'll look at questions of flight, uh, flying or staying. Should you stay or should you go? What are the moral ramifications for that? Can some people flee? Do they have responsibilities to stay? Uh, what are those types of issues that are arising in various contexts? Um, the questions of death and what uh, increasingly throughout the early modern period into the modern period, uh, not only are we experiencing the death, but people are analyzing it and the mathematical uh, statistical analyses begin to develop already in the 1600s and they become rather sophisticated. Even without full understanding of the causes of the disease, we're getting very sophisticated mathematical analyses of these uh, growing as we enter the modern period. So we'll look a little bit at that. And then finally, the question of contagion following wherever people go and what are the responses to the varying views of contagion uh, throughout history. Um, as it kind of necessitates uh, because of the short nature of this, I'm going to be somewhat superficial 
in touching on a variety of different issues. Of course, we could look at uh, several dozen more epidemics as examples, and I'd be happy to pursue anything in either further in question and answer, either in further breadth, uh, talk about some additional examples in, in different contexts or depth if we want to dive into anything. I've also included a variety of, of images of, of texts of sources from the various periods that, that I'm going to talk about. And I've typically, oftentimes I've transcribed um, uh, the text that one can actually look, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time, with a few exceptions, I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading all of those texts. I'll kind of summarize and I'll fly myself through some of these as we, um, and we can encounter more of them in the question and answer later if you want to pursue any of them. Um, Let's see here. Um, the relevance of this is, of course, in the university context, very clear. That picture actually was taken about two hours ago. I came back to campus in the afternoon on Furman and saw the flag at half staff and was wondering what was going on. And I thought through this a little bit and realized that actually that is at half staff because of the half million uh, US lives lost. Um, so the COVID here on the campus, the, the stark reminder, but even historically, um, here is an image of the 1918 influenza epidemic, a little in the Furman Bulletin that uh, my campus being shut uh, in the midst of the flu, uh, classes and other athletic and academic events being closed. Um, I'd like to hear more about you all's experience and, and how that how you're dealing with that. If you have some comments and things like that, you could talk about, but we're, we're, we're dealing with this right now and that makes the, the context even more relevant, right? Um, makes it relevant enough that it makes it more interesting to read ordinances, for instance, from the 1665 London plague for Oxford University, the ways in which uh, they were dealing with the plague uh, and the, the rules and regulations that were being put into place to uh, deal with those particular concerns of, of migration and people coming in, bringing the plague with them and trying to remain safe in the midst of all of this. Um, questions of historical relevance, of course, are somewhat complicated. Um, Will mentioned uh, repeating history or history rhyming. Um, and there's a question of, of the extent to which these, these similarities are, are just like COVID or not, uh, as one often hears. So um, I was interested already early on in the spring as COVID was starting to sweep through the US, um, there were these examples and people digging back into history for the, the interest in epidemics. Um, in, in late April, there was a, uh, an, an article uh, by a colleague of mine at University of Arizona um, in the conversation online and the caption to the heading, she didn't write this, but there were eerie similarities, it says, between Pepys' time, uh, 17th century uh, writer and our own, as we see a 17th century body being loaded onto a cart and a 2020 uh, COVID uh, patient being wheeled into the hospital. Um, the article itself was called The Diary of Samuel Pepys Shows How, um, sorry, one second here, I just lost this on my screen, okay. Um, the Diary of Samuel Pepys Shows How Life Under the Bubonic Plague Mirrored Today's Pandemic. So clearly a claim for relevance. Um, this particular piece was in, uh, Samuel Pepys was a diarist. He wrote uh, extensive diaries. So we have day by day accounts of life in the 1665 London plague. Uh, this was published on April 24th, 2020. And interestingly also published on the same day, uh, another epidemic historian uh, at, at Georgetown University, Timothy Newfield, uh, posted an opinion piece to the Toronto Globe and Mail and note the slightly different take from a historian. Nothing was the same. Historical parallels for the coronavirus should be avoided like the plague, he said. Despite the instinct to look to the past for ways forward, it can be unhelpful and even harmful to do so when it comes to pandemic. So to, today I'm going to try to maybe thread that needle to go a little bit between those two approaches that everything was eerily simil similar to there's no comparison whatsoever and try to contextualize things a little bit so we have some points of, of reference that we can dig into a little bit. Um, as I start, uh, before I get into the broader context, um, here is a, a plague broadsheet, a kind of like a poster that you could have hanging in your house, and for instance, from 1665. Uh, note the, the skeletons and the symbols of death along the outside. Um, 
In the middle, there is a picture very much like a more schematic version that we started with, uh, that, that picture of death with the hourglass and, a, and a, an arrow in his hand, the skeleton as people are fleeing and being quarantined, et cetera. Um, this is a true, a Lord have mercy upon us, it says, a true relation of seven modern plagues in London or visitations, that's another word that's used in the 17th century, the visitation of the plague, uh, with the number of those that were buried in all diseases. Uh, the first in the year, this is the first of the more recent plagues, so they go back to 1348 in England, uh, but the first uh, that they're talking about here in Queen Elizabeth's reign, 1592, 1603, the third in 1625, and note it says that never to be forgotten year, that was known as the Great Plague by the mid-17th century, 1630, 1636, so the recurring plagues, um, and they were in fact recurring, so even though we have the Black Death that hits and it's a pandemic across Europe in, 16, in 1347, 48, 49, uh, it repeats itself every 10 to 15, sometimes 20 years in most especially major cities in Europe. It's never pandemic again across all of Europe, but various regions have epidemic outbreaks, uh, typically once or twice a generation. And so as we're getting into the 17th century, most adults will have experienced the plague. Uh, even if we can't understand it, they will have experienced the plague at least once or twice by the time they're in their adult years. Um, so they, they, they have these stories, they have the accounts, they have their parents having talked about those accounts. So it becomes a real thing, but it's not um, completely unusual. It's very fearsome, but it's not unusual. Um, and you can see lots of tables and numbers along this. Uh, people were interested in the data and 1620, that pulled out one, a blown up one section here. These are the weekly death totals. Uh, you can see the weeks, the total deaths, the plague deaths in the second and third columns, um, kind of going through 1625. And then the other plagues are also lining the broadsheet. Um, there are some recipes, uh, some medicines, certain approved medicines. Uh, this one is a cheap medicine to keep from infection. Take a pint of new milk, cut two cloves of garlic, very small, put it in milk, drink it in the morning, and it preserveth from infection. Um, down at the bottom, some more, an ale pasta, so a kind of a curdled milk with warm ale, put pimpernel in it, and that can actually remove the plague from the heart if it gets that bad. Uh, so, and there are lots of these books as well circulating with cures and remedies for the plague. Uh, and then in the middle, there is a long poem with some religious um, encouragement as well as it's, it's rather fearful uh, this what this plague is, but it's a reminder that um, we all are mortal, we all will die and we are in God's hands despite the fact we can't control this. Um, and so these are the types of things that will in fact be circulating in the, in the 17th century. Now, let me turn to government orders, especially quarantine and those kinds of things. These are the rules uh, for Oxford, once again, at the beginning of it. Um, the opening lines, whereas there is a daily increase of the plague in the city of London, the suburbs and parts adjacent to London, by reason whereof very many persons have of late and daily do withdraw themselves from their respective habitations. So this is the fleeing that we'll be talking about. And many of them are coming here or to other places whereby the infection has been dispersed into many towns and villages thereof to their ruin and impoverishing. So people are spreading the plague as they're trying to run away from it. And therefore we need these orders so that we can protect the university, we can protect uh, our cities. So we'll see some of the orders that are put into place. Um, there is a 1603, there are earlier orders as well, but here's an example from 1603, uh, King James I, became king. Elizabeth had just died in 1603. He actually had to postpone his uh, entry into London for his coronation because the plague was raging that summer of 1603. Uh, but he issued these orders from his privy council uh, for England, um, calling the justices of the peace together to uh, coordinate uh, in the various places where infection was hitting various towns, uh, to measure um, their, their wealth, to find out where uh, they should be able to relieve the poor that are infected and how to, they're going to be quarantined. So how can you take care of poor people in their houses uh, to regulate the taxes, to find out where the wealthy people are that can pay these funds to help the poor, uh, to hire viewers as they were called, to, to view the dead, to determine what people were dying of, which diseases, plague and other diseases. Um, when someone had the plague, 
Uh, the houses were to be closed for six weeks. So there was a quarantine period of six weeks in the, uh, after the last sickness disappeared or last person had died um, before the house could be occupied or opened again. If anyone who's infected or connected with the plague leaves there to wear some mark in their uppermost garments and bear white rods in their hands when they go abroad so that people know that they might have the plague. Uh, people are to have watchmen appointed if the masters and owners at second bullet point, if the masters and owners of the houses infected will not duly observe the directions of shutting up their doors, especially at night, there should be appointed one or two, two or three watchmen by turns, which shall be sworn to attend and watch the house and to apprehend any person that shall come out of the house contrary to the order. And if someone does this on a couple of times, the justices will have them imprisoned in the stocks next to their house. Um, Furthermore, some special mark shall be made and affixed to the doors of every of the infected houses, typically a cross. Um, and where any such houses be inns or alehouses, so public houses, the public signs of being the alehouse or the tavern uh, will be taken down for a time of the restraint, is what they're calling the quarantine, the restraint, and some cross or other mark set upon as a token of the sickness. Uh, clothes and bedding and other stuff uh, shall be burned or aired uh, to get the poisonous air out of them. And if a person is perceived as uh, the loss of such apparel, bedding and other stuff will be burnt as greater than the poor person can bear, the justices should use the poor funds to recompense them for the loss of their stuff, but they will have their materials burned if they have the plague. Um, they are to have, uh, especially for the poor, those who are quarantined are restrained or to have be provided and delivered all the necessities of food, fire for, for fuel and medicines. Um, and any of those who are attending to the poor in their houses are not to have public assembly during the time of their attendance, but they're also to wear clothes that mark that they've been around people who are sick. Um, and then finally, this was what is uh, to some of the most interesting uh, in the midst of all this, the final of the orders is that if there be any person ecclesiastical, so a clergyman or lay person that shall hold or publish any opinions that they shouldn't, that are discouraging to the public, um, for instance, saying that no person will die, but at their time prefixed, so everybody's going to die, uh, it's discouraging to people. Um, they shall be re reprehended. If they're clergymen, they shall be removed from preaching by the bishop. If they're a lay person, they'll be ordered to cease uttering such dangerous opinions upon pain of imprisonment. Um, and then they will be imprisoned if they continue. So uh, this attempt to maintain a public discourse of, of encouragement in the midst of this horrid situation uh, is, is trying to be emphasized. Um, Another example from 1603 of quarantine, this time of goods, um, good ships were to unload their uh, goods, stop uh, about 15 miles before they got to London and wait for 40 days, which is where we get the word quarantine. It's a reference to the 40. Um, so wait for 40 days and uh, then unload their ships and air out their goods before bringing them in, um, so foreign goods. Um, and these are the merchants, the Eastland Company, they trade with the Baltic, they trade with Scandinavia, and the merchants uh, wrote a letter of complaint. This is the copy of their letter right here in their handwritten letter, petitioning the, the Queens and then later the King James's uh, principal secretary for help in this, um, saying we've heard that this is going to come, it's going to be implemented, that all ships coming are going to be stayed for a time in the River of Thames beneath Woolwich, up, that's, gonna, that's about 12, 15 miles away, and not to unlaid until trial of 40 days that they shall be cleared themselves to be free from the said disease. And for better assurance, they're to air their goods in open fields. Now, we are most willing, they write, to observe the same as far as conveniently we may. So trying to say we're good subjects, but it's not convenient. Um, we can't do that. We're going to have our goods destroyed from weather or they'll be stolen. This will be great economic damage to us by spoiling and imperiling our goods. Um, and then they go on to describe why not only is it economically problematic to have this quarantine, but it's not necessary. Um, first of all, most of our goods that we're bringing in are not apt to infection. So they, they list things, soap, uh, corn, 
pitch, tar, copper, wax, iron, the plague won't be carried on these things. The rest of the goods that might carry infection, such as flax and hemp and linen things, that's less dangerous because of the way in which we do it. These Baltic towns uh, keep their storehouses about 20 miles outside of the town, so people are not around. They will not have picked up the plague. Moreover, another third argument, um, these ships that are coming in that are going to be quarantined, they've been su sufficiently tried already. They've already been eight weeks on the way, so they shouldn't have to wait another 40 days. And finally, they appeal to the law overall. In London, we're required to unload our ships at a certain wharf, and if we don't, we'll forfeit and lose all of our goods. And now you, the federal government, if you will, the, the royal government, are telling us to violate the laws of London. Um, by, by doing this. And therefore, we humbly beseech you, this person with political connections, uh, that the said commandment so impossible to be observed without great damage may be revoked, and that we ourselves um, will use the best course that we may, that no danger happen thereby. So don't you regulate us, we will handle things ourselves. And this is this appeal, but the, the economic uh, effects of this are being talked about. Another um, ordinance this time from 1665, and I won't go through all of it. It's it, there are a lot of similarities. It's build they build on each other. This is the City of London as opposed to the national ordinance from the king. Um, it, by 1665, the quarantine is down to 28 days, uh, four weeks instead of one uh, instead of six weeks. And then it also outlines more explicitly a variety of civic workers and, and positions that have been created for this plague time. Examiners to determine who has the plague and, and are these plague spots plague or not. Watchmen to take care of the people in the, in the infected houses and make sure they stay in quarantine. Women searchers, and they're specifically identified by gender in this context. So the searchers are the ones that determine the cause of death of, of the of people who die, what the diseases are, which ones are plagued. Keepers, nurse keepers to take care of, especially the poor, bringing them food and medicines and things like that in their house since they can't leave. Surgeons, barriers, uh, funerals are regulated when and where funerals can take place. Rakers for the streets um, to keep the streets clean. Um, animals are prohibited and they're dog killers that are hired, that's their title in, in London. Um, to take care of the animals to make sure that they're not spreading plague. And then finally, at the very end of the 1665 London Ordinances for Health, there are uh, five or four ordinances dealing with loose persons and idle assemblies in the broader context. Um, one deals with begging. Nothing is more complained of than the multitude of rogues and wandering beggars that swarm in every place about the city, being a great cause of the spreading of the infection. Um, so linking questions of poverty and causes of infection, and then there are regulations that are also put into place to deal with begging. Um, theater and plays and things like that are to be regulated. Public assemblies, that all plays, bear baitings, games, singing of ballads, buckler plays, a sword play, or other such like causes of assemblies of people be utterly prohibited and then severely punished if there are people offending those rules. All public feasting, and dinners at taverns, alehouses, and other places of common entertainment should be stopped until further order and allowance. And, and here we have a moral component added to this, the money thereby saved should be preserved and employed for the benefit and relief of the poor visited with the infection. So take care of the poor with your money instead of public activities at taverns um, for food. And then also now drinking, alcoholic drinking, tippling, that disorderly tippling in taverns, alehouses, coffee houses, and cellars be severely looked into as the common sin of this time and greatest occasion for dispersing the plague, and that no company or person be suffered to stay or come into any tavern, alehouse, or coffee house to drink after nine o'clock in the evening. So we have these, that's the final of the regulations for London. We have these regulations being put in place, varieties of things, quarantines, and, and shutting things down to try to stop the plague. Um, now the question of fleeing or staying. Um, uh, this is a quotation from Boccaccio. There are moral components here um, from his Decameron, which he wrote just after the plague had hit. He's in Florence, the Florence area. 
Um, and he describes in his introduction the plague that, that they've just experienced, uh, the various approaches to the plague. Some people became very pious and stopped eating and drinking food and they were, were whipping themselves, flagellating themselves. Others were um, taking the opposite, the extreme pitch, uh, 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 opinion of we're going to die anyhow, so eat, drink, and to be merry for tomorrow we'll die. But others were of a crueler opinion, he writes, though it was perhaps a safer one. They maintained that there was no better medicine against the plague than to flee from it. And convinced of this reasoning, not caring about anything but themselves, men and women in great numbers abandoned their city, their houses, their farms, their relatives, including he goes on to talk about parents abandoning children, their possessions and sought other places. And they went at least as far away as the Florentine countryside, as if the wrath of God could not pursue them with this pestilence wherever they went, but would only strike those that found within the walls of the city. Um, and this actually plays out in, in a number of real circumstances as people not just talk about it theoretically, but uh, are, are punished for it or co condemned for it. Uh, Lancelot Andrews uh, is involved in one of these cases in 1603, that 1603 London plague. Um, he was a prominent figure in the Church of England. He later will become a bishop, so he continues to rise. At the moment, he's Dean of Westminster Abbey, and he's a chaplain at the Royal Chapel in Whitehall Palace. And in 1603, in the midst of the plague, he preaches a sermon on the plague, on the pestilence. And note where he preaches it at, at Chiswick in 1603, which is significant because he's not from there. He's actually supposed to be in Westminster, but he has fled to Chiswick, which is up in the countryside outside of London uh, to the west. Um, and in the midst of his sermon on the pestilence, he quoted uh, Proverbs and he quoted, as he said here, the bullet point there, Solomon saith, a wise man feareth the plague and departeth from it and fools run on and be careless. A wise man doth it fear the plague and a good man too departing from the plague. So um, this was his argument. The problem is, and this is what some critics will say that actually Proverbs 14, 16 doesn't say a wise man fears and departs from the plague. It says a wise man fears and departs from evil. Um, and so people are gonna start criticizing him, including Henoch Clapham, who is a more Puritan minister. And he writes a letter during this plague in 1603, teaching what it is and how the people of God should carry themselves toward God and their neighbor. And in the midst of it, he doesn't criticize Andrews by name, but he criticizes the use, misuse of that verse um, and talks about how the Bible teaches that we should care for our neighbors. And such fleers, he says, writes, are left to God to be lied to contradict scripture and abuse their brethren, which is a far worse play plague than that which they fly from and the, what they should do with their brethren. He mentions at the bottom of that quote, uh, they should be in the city performing works of mercy to the sick and the needy. It's not change of place, he says, but change of life that must help us. So making a moral claim rather than running away from it if you have that responsibility. The problem that Clapham faces in the midst of this and why I mentioned this particular case is that the 1603 ordinance, remember the discouragement is prohibited and um, the Bishop of London accused him of publishing this order that uh, created this, this bad opinion um, and laid charges against him and brought the case to, interestingly enough, Lancelot Andrews and uh, Clapham for his criticisms of flight will be thrown into prison for three years um, for his criticism, um, having criticizing the who person will be the judge in your case was probably not a wise move. Um, jumping ahead a little bit to the middle of the century, one more example of flight is uh, William Boghurst or the lack of flight. He was an apothecary in 1665 in the middle of the London plague. This is from a, a advertisement in a newspaper advertising William Boghurst apothecary pharmacist um, is, is taking care of 40, 50, 60 patients a day uh, in the midst of the plague. This is the summer of 1665. Um, but after the plague, he writes a book, an account of the plague. And in the midst of this long book, he, he talks about who may fly and who may not. And he says it's, 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 um, uh, it's not an easy uh, decision. Some people can, other people should not. Um, for other people, I think it all may fly that are free and not obliged to stay either by their office relations or necessities, such as magistrates, ministers, physicians, apothecaries, surgeons, midwives. Every man that undertakes to be of a profession or takes upon him any office must take all parts of it, the good and the evil, the pleasure and the pain, the profit and the inconvenience altogether, and not pick and choose. 
for ministers must preach, captains must fight, physicians must attend the sick, etc. And then he goes on with a complaint, but two or three of the youngest physicians, because all the rest have fled, are appointed in a plague time to look after 30 or 40,000 sick people when four or 500 physicians is too few. And another time when we don't have the epidemic, when there dies but two or 300 people a week, you have five or 600 physicians hanging after them if they be well lined with white metal, they've got silver. So uh, talking about physicians need to attend to sick and not to be worried about money. Um, and there's that responsibility based on particular offices. Um, other writers at this time here, theological queries. So a clergyman making these similar claims about analyzing who should, who should run, who can't run, uh, who should stay in their positions despite the concerns about their hazard of their own life. You have a responsibility, um, uh, as it mentions here, magistrates, ministers, soldiers, husbands and wives shouldn't flee each other, parents and children masters and servants, nurses, helpers in all kinds of necessities, these must stay in their place and calling and expose themselves to danger for performing the work which belongs to them. Um, that's what's necessary for being a Christian. That's what's necessary for, um, instead of being down at their bottom, barbarous in, barbarously inhumane. The third point that I want to simply mention here, um, that dealing with the dead, um, not just dealing with the dead bodies and burying, but increasingly there's a counting of the dead and using those counts and those statistics to model and predict the future. And I'm not going to go into great depth. I'm simply going to highlight a couple of issues. Um, some of you might've studied the mathematical modeling that takes place, especially in the 20th and 21st century. Now, especially in the digital age with computers, we can have very highly sophisticated models. You've heard a lot in the last year about curves and flattening the curves and all those types of things. Uh, we can have very intricate models uh, based on data and, and trying to guess, even though we don't have this particular disease before, trying to guess and then tweak our models uh, in, increasingly add new variables. This particular image is from a 1927 model that kind of forms the basis for modern plague and epidemic uh, modeling. Um, that, that line you can see the, is what the mathematical model produced and those dots represent the actual data um, from a, a plague epidemic in Bombay, which is what they were using to create this. And you can see the model that they developed with those few variables that become far more sophisticated actually does approximate the data very fairly closely. And now we can, again, refine our models far more quickly and effectively. Um, but going back into the 17th century, uh, to the English context, John Grant, uh, prior to the plague outbreak. He had never experienced a plague personally, but he'd been reading the statistics uh, from London that had been produced in previous outbreaks. Uh, he writes in 1662, analyzing these, these uh, accounts, the natural and political observations with reference to government, religion, trade, growth, air, diseases, and several changes of London, uh, using these to create uh, basically mortality tables and, and making uh, predictions that impact, again, politics, economics, etc. cetera. Uh, in the midst of the plague, he continues his mathematical meanderings, basically. He reflects on the bills of mortality uh, to, to, in essence, uh, argue that actually those searchers who are uh, not trained in medicine necessarily, but they're making decisions about what people are dying of are are basically undercounting the plague, that there are more people dying of the plague than um, they're indicating and using mathematical claims for that. Um, in the midst of the plague itself, and we've got access to the, the entire weekly bills of mortality as they're called, because in this particular book, he collected them and published them after the plague to make sure for posterity that we are not missing any of them. He wanted to make sure that uh, communicate these under the nation so they were not just um, posted and disappeared after the week of, of the news. Um, but these bills of mortality provide uh, the data of parish by parish on the front, which is on the left page here, um, the 130 parishes in, in the London and its suburbs, how many people died and how many people died of the plague that week. On the other page, there are the diseases that they've died of, including when plague shows up. And then down at the bottom, we have the number of baptized or christened, as well as the number of dead uh, by gender. 
um, as well as how many plague deaths as well. So in December um, of 1664, before the plague really hits, we have 291 death and dead and one dying of the plague. Um, by the summer, the plague is really starting to pick up in 1665. And so by mid-June, we have, <clears throat> as you can see there in the bottom right, 112 people dying of the plague, uh, 558 dying and <clears throat> completely that week. Um, by the end of the month, we have 470 dying of the plague. The next week, we have 725 dying of the plague. Uh, the next week, 1,089. A month later, we're up to 4,200. A month after that, we're up to 7,100 dying of the plague, when normally there were about 300 people dying a week. Now we have 8,300 people dying a week. So the plague was very uh, problematic, and it had a tremendous impact on London in a variety of ways. Um, another statistician, um, Susmelk, a Prussian um, clergyman who actually had access to church records, and he used these to um, discuss uh, birth and death and procreation and marriage and all kinds of things, analyzing those for the government in Prussia in the mid 1700s. And he writes a book called The Divine Order in the Changes in the Mention in the Human Race, basically. It's a multi-volume work. And he basically lays the, the, the foundation for a statistical method that is still somewhat influential in kind of the basis for insurance and actuarial science with, with mortality tables based on particular ages, of death rates in particular contexts. But at the beginning, he gives a little bit of his philosophy based on his findings mathematically. Everything is arranged according to definite numbers and proportions. Men are born and men die, but always in a certain ratio. Children are born, sons and daughters seemingly jumbled together, but without violation of the order once chosen by God. Men die at first sight irregularly as regards age, but upon more exact observation in accordance with fixed proportions. Um, so again, these kinds of statistical approaches are being used and the first really mathematical model using this kind of calculus uh, based model of, of, of the epidemic to predict the future um, is by Daniel Bernoulli in 1760, um, published in 1766, written in 1760, on how to prevent smallpox by inoculation of children. And he goes through a variety of, of tables and data uh, and comes up with a model based on what would happen if we inoculate all children, how many would die of the inoculation, how many people would live at various ages, what would be the benefits for society for uh, more people surviving if we do something like this. And his claim at the beginning is, I simply wish that in a matter which so closely concerns the well-being of the human race, no decision shall be made without all the knowledge which a which a little analysis and calculation can provide. So as we're getting into the modern period, increasingly there are calls for and concerns for um, mathematical analysis uh, and they become very sophisticated again in the last century or so in the last 30 years in particular. And then finally, um, and I'm just going to mention this very quickly, I'll run through some examples of uh, containing contagions, especially we've seen this a little bit in those regulations, but as we move into the modern period, the ideas of what is a contagion, what is a, the source of an epidemic is, is changing um, from what it had been in the 17th century. By the 18th century, people are arguing that epidemics are contagious, um, but not everyone. So in 1819, this is a parliamentary, so government in, par in London is getting involved with uh, this medical question, this committee is appointed to consider the val validity of the doctrine of contagion in the plague, largely for economic reasons to determine whether or not we should continue with laws of quarantine. But they're calling in doctors, they're calling in uh, businessmen who are facing quarantine, who've been in countries with the plague to decide what is the source and the most effective way of containing these diseases. And they call in a variety of doctors, and I'm just going to show you some. There's a disagreement. Um, what causes it? In yellow there, this doctor who's been a doctor for 30 years, had the plague himself. You consider the plague is not contagious, the report asked him. Yes, he said. Explain how you caught the fever by the air. It was August. That's the time when the plague is around in Constantinople. I was a stranger. Uh, I was not used to the climate. There were particular circumstances. I was deprived of food, didn't have nourishment. So my, my constitution of my body 
caused me to get sick, but it was not infectious. It was not contagious from someone else. Other doctors, uh, however, said, uh, this is Dr. Foster, um, favor the committee with your opinion on the subject of the plague, he was asked. I conceive under certain circumstances it's contagious. Uh, Dr. William Gladstone, from what you've seen of the plague with your own eyes, he's the naval uh, surgeon uh, for the British Navy. Um, do you consider it high, contagious? I consider it highly contagious, he says. My opinion is that it uh, can be spread in the sick chamber, but also by simple contact, by feeling the pulse. So varying degrees of contagion, but we still don't quite know what causes plague yet. Um, that's not going, or, or smallpox or plague. We don't have germs. We don't actually have a mechanism for transmission until the late 1800s. Robert Koch dis discovers the, the bacteria that, that creates tuberculosis called consumption, which reshapes the way in which people approach the disease. People had seen it prior to this as kind of a romantic, as, as horrible as it was. It consumed the body from the inside. Uh, they saw it as an inherited disease. Men oftentimes saw themselves as this gift of almost genius, the struggling genius that is tormented. Women saw it, there was, there was a fashion movement in the 18th century to dress and actually use makeup so that women looked as if they had consumption. Um, so it was a it was this this romantic vision of it, but he determined that it is proved that there are germs that cause this, and this creates a new way of containing a disease. Um, in the 1890s, they they find the bacteria for plague, for instance. Um, Koch continues looking at other diseases like cholera and, and, and anthrax and things like that. And in order to regulate this, they determine since it now can be spread uh, and not merely inherited, um, you don't want to give it to others. So governments are beginning to regulate spitting, for instance. These are signs that are posted in the streetcars in New York. Um, this is a, a Kansas newspaper talking about these um, uh, regulations in Philadelphia, in New York, uh, in Los Angeles has just uh, passed a spitting ban in public. San Francisco is considering it. Um, letters to the editor in the New York Times, uh, anti-spitting crusaders who are turning people in for spitting in public against the law. Uh, the police, though, one other letter saying the police are spitting and they're not enforcing the law. Conductors of the streetcars are spitting and violating the law. So this was a very lively debate in the early 1900s. Um, and similar debates break out when the, the influenza hits in, in 1918. Um, this is from the San Francisco Chronicle. Remember, we're in the middle of World War I, or toward the end of it, actually, although we don't know that 100% at the moment. Um, uh, things are look like it might be ending, but we're in the middle of war. And so most of the paper headlines frequently talk about the war, but note this is a war against influenza on the front page, spread in city, con the city continuing. And every, every story's headline is the, de the decrease in cases noted during the day, attempts at vaccines, although they don't have, and they, they never find the cause during the outbreak of what, it, what was causing it. They can't have a vaccine, but they're trying to get a vaccine. Serums to produce it. Um, uh, down below the fold, there are other warning and appeal, wear masks and help nurse the sick. Increased vigilance will check influenza, which is now at its worst. There's a sharp increase in influenza shown in army camps, mask wearing those checking the Richmond epidemic. And then some problems coming along with the, the masks that are being worn because San Francisco has just passed a mask ordinance requiring people to wear masks, uh, gauze masks. Um, and then um, here's a holdup, uh, three uh, people wearing influenza masks uh, robbed a taxi driver. They got in his taxi and they beat him up, knocked him unconscious, threw him out and and stole his car. Uh, another um, on the same, this is all on the same page, same front page. Three are shot in a struggle with a mask slacker, someone who refused to wear the mask. The health inspector tried to enforce the order. The man hit him with his coin purse and knocked him down and the health inspector drew a gun and started firing and three people were hit with bullets. So the tension over masks was, was rather fierce. Um, and note the word mask slacker. Um, is is a, a use of a common phrase that was in the World War I era. A slacker was uh, what we now what later was called a draft dodger, someone who was refusing to register, refusing to join the draft for the war. Um, and there were lots of reports of slackers being rounded up by the police. They were hiding from uh, the army and those kinds of things. But now they're referring to mask slackers as those who are refusing to go along with masks. 
Um, on that same page, there are also 100 mask slackers held on charges of disturbing the peace with a variety of different fines. Some were fined $5, $10, 10-day jail sentences, 30-day jail, jail terms. Um, the judges are giving lectures uh, about the neglect to wear a mask and promise to be sterner in the future. The chief of police saying that if the judge sends all the people that are arrested to jail for failing to wear masks, he could not take care of them in the prison. And my, my favorite is the end of this. Um, most of the men arrested yesterday pleaded forgetfulness when accosted by the police. John Raggy, however, arrested in Columbus Avenue in San Francisco, said he did not wear a mask because he did not believe in masks or ordinances or even jails. John did not believe in the draft either and had no registration card. He has now no occasion to disbelieve in jails because he is in the city prison. So the, the mask slacker concern is sweeping San Francisco. A week later, a thousand are arrested as mask slackers. A former policeman is held as a mask slacker. Um, when he was told to put on a mask, he said he would when he's good and ready. And uh, when a wo young woman passed by wearing her mask on her chin, he started saying she should be arrested along with him. Um, but in Los Angeles, if you read the Los Angeles Times, they have a completely different take, uh, mocking the masks of San Francisco and mocking those who are uh, putting their faith in masks. And, um, and we can talk about some of those uh, later if you want. I'll, I'm going to um, skip those. Uh, we'll just end here. But Pasadena had passed a mask ordinance and um, against the flu and, and the LA Times headline is, is mocking Mas Pasadena for this. And on the same page, pointing out the, co the conflict between the City of Angels and the City of Masks, as they called San Francisco. There are more deaths in the City of Masks. San Francisco's flu toll is far above ours. So masks, uh, San LA Times is calling masks germ scarers. Um, and uh, San Francisco is putting its faith in the germ scarers, uh, whereas we're able to open our schools and do these kinds of things. So the, this, this, this variety of responses shifts in various locations at the same time, across time, as politics, as religion, as uh, views of medical causes shift. Um, and increasingly, in all of these contexts, we have officials, government officials, private individuals uh, trying to take advantage of the best circumstances they can, but coming up with different solutions and different reactions. So um, as, I, as I wind up, I simply want to turn things over for some questions and, and uh, answers. Uh, we can deal with some things and uh, look at some of your own experiences. Thank you so much, Professor Failer, for your presentation. We're now just going to take some questions from the audience. Um, so the first is you talk a little bit in, during, I believe, the plague that people used to spend their money taking care of the poor instead of for public activities. So what role did social norms play in previous pandemics in terms of keeping people in? And to what extent do those norms still exist or do not exist today? I think the norms still exist. Um, so those, I mean, so the particular norms have changed and the particular norms do change and they, they vary from place to place. And, and like I said, even if you are reading um, in 1918 or if uh, read the, the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, as well as small newspapers, you will read letters to the editor that are completely different points of view in different cities. Um, now, again, that's partly um, uh, determined by the editorial board and the, 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 the viewpoints of the newspapers, not necessarily that they represent everyone in those cities. But you see, even at the same time, different norms in different uh, contexts based on geographic context, political alliances and allegiances. Um, in New York, frequently, uh, you see lots of letters to the editor condemning um, the lack of concern because of political corruption, for instance. Um, they're, they're saying we should have greater concern, but we don't because the government is corrupt, Tammany Hall and those kinds of things at the turn of the 20th century. So um, the, the norms were not uncontested, however, even in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, there were people uh, who were um, not going along with some of these norms, and that's what 
folks are, are for instance, condemning them for, right? You are, you're violating the norm, what should be the norms, although according to many of the counts, lots of people were breaking them, what should be the norms of taking care of people, people are fleeing, people are not doing what they're supposed to do. So there's an appeal to the norms, there's an appeal in the, the, the early modern context, especially to uh, Christian interpretations of scripture that, that call on these types of activities. Um, to some extent, those uh, social norms have certainly been modified, um, but, they, but many of the um, letters, many of the uh, documents from the 20th century could have been written in the 16th century and vice versa, um, depending on the context. Our next question is, if it was unclear if the plague was contagious, then what was the rationale for quarantine? That is the question that lots of people were asking. <laughs> um, um, there was there was no medical understand. There was no medical apparatus for actual uh, mechanism for contagion. So the um, in fact the doctor who was saying in in eighteen nineteen uh, saying that there was. Um, that things were not contagious. He's actually saying the quarantine is actually costing people their lives. He, had, he gives an example in, in there that um, there was a man who was sick on one of the ships that was quarantined uh, according to policy in the past, this current system, and uh, couldn't get treatment because other doctors wouldn't treat um, because then they would have to be quarantined. And when the quarantine was finally lifted, uh, he died a few days later from lack of medical treatment, not because he had the plague, but because he was sick and couldn't get treatment. So the system, in essence, of quarantine killed him. So that was that doctor's, that doctor's anecdote that he throws into the story. Um, but the, the context prior to that, increasingly, there's a, a sense of contagion as we're getting to the 19th century, even though we don't have germs yet. But the idea was that there's something causing this illness that is not really explainable, right? It is, um, it's one thing, the, the, the view of disease was that there are individual manifestations of uh, imbalance within one's body. Um, that's what makes one sick. But when everybody around us is getting sick from the same thing, there must be some other environmental factor. So we don't know what it is, but there is something that is spreading it, uh, taking it into the air, for instance. So there, there are views of poisoned air and um, food and things like that that might be triggering it, but we don't have another mechanism. So there is a variant of contagion, but it's not expressly identified and it's debated for several centuries. In response to the two opinions that the current epidemic is very similar or or totally dissimilar to previous plagues, where do you come down on that scale? My own take is uh, not, it's less, it, it partly depends on whether we're talking kind of medically or if we're talking um, in reactions. And that's actually what I tend to like to focus on is what are the reactions of people, of institutions, of governments, of um, organizations and drawing those comparisons. And in that context, I find tremendous similarities of uh, across, um, across these scenes. And especially um, when we look at more recent, um, as we get closer into the 20th century and later 20th century with various epidemics, um, we can actually see, I, I feel, if you will, a little bit closer to um, the arguments that are being made, I can understand them because of the, the social uh, understandings and the context in which they're, 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 they're closer to what I'm used to hearing in my own circles and in my own um, uh, life. And so there I can associate more directly with those. As we get farther back, there are certainly similarities, right? Attempts to, um, uh, help people, attempts to uh, avoid, attempts to protect yourself, attempts to protect your family. Um, those kinds of things are similar, but there are, are increasing degrees of, of difference because of the social and religious and intellectual shifts that have taken place. So um, on the medical standpoint, 
the um, again, that's a slightly separate question, but the medical responses have varied as well um, to the different diseases as we got, especially after germ theory in particular, um, as we got into the 1900s, um, there was a great push for um, solving. We've solved uh, tuberculosis. We know what caused it. We've solved the plague. At least we've, we've come up with ways of dealing with it increasingly successful. There was an assumption that we can solve influenza, the 1918, and they gradually do, although it took longer than they wanted. And by the middle of the century, we've had such success with things like polio and smallpox, um, um, in a fairly short period of time eradicating, or at least regionally eradicating them, that there was a great sense of optimism, especially in the United States and in Western medicine, that we can pretty much eradicate everything. So there was this, this sense that we can uh, take care of, of everything ultimately, and we don't have to worry about diseases. And that optimism, as we get to the late 20th century, ends up disappearing because of the new diseases. We kind of, we got overly ambitious, I think, and. Uh, uh, expected that we can solve all the problems and then we get a little bit surprised we haven't had a big plague for a long time especially in uh, the United States and we get a little bit surprised that maybe we can't solve it quite as uh, much as we thought we could however medical activities from mathematical modeling to um, uh, genetic sampling and, and, and mapping have allowed for a much faster medical response than we've ever had, right? So medical science has in fact advanced, but um, it nevertheless, there are, there are mental, we, we assume oftentimes that we're going to get a faster response than, than we're able to have. Before we conclude, I just wanna give you the opportunity to share any parting thoughts with the audience. Um, I would just simply like, and I, I would love to hear from anyone if um, anyone wants, I think you probably can get my email fairly easily. I'd love to hear from any uh, particular anecdotes and experiences you have personally, as well as any kind of historical uh, uh, reading things that you've done on particular other epidemics. Like I said, we could have gone in a lot of different directions with talking about other, other activities um, and other epidemics. And I'd love to pursue those with anyone who has questions. I'd love to hear about some personal experiences that you're having currently right now with your own experiences with the plague. But um, I think the main, my main takeaway in history as a whole, let alone history of epidemics is even though there are great differences, kind of getting to your question about rhyming and uh, repeating itself, there are great differences frequently. If we contextualize the historical uh, circumstances that we're analyzing, we can see enough similarities that allow us to empathize, I think rather uh, helpfully and usefully with people in the past, which increases our empathy for uh, how, we, how we act right now. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. Special thanks to Timothy Thaler and to all of those who sent in their questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual ATH event, which will be this coming Tuesday, March 2nd at 5 p.m. Pacific. CMC's own Professor John Shields will moderate a panel with Warren Cass, Mona Charon, and John Wood Jr. on the future of the Republican Party. See you all then.